In his first year as a trapper, mountain man James Kleiman has survived one ordeal after another. But now, after getting separated from his trapping brigade, Kleiman undertakes a harrowing 600-mile journey out of the wilderness that will push him to the brink of starvation and death. The site of a Pawnee village presents an impossible decision. He can ask for help and risk a painful death, or remain at the mercy of a punishing wilderness that seems determined to kill him slowly. Mm. of the mistrustful Pawnee. James Kleiman can only hope that a show of courage and resolve will prevent a slow and agonizing death. Then do it! I'm ready for death! Skilled trapper, scout, soldier, and guide, James Kleiman may be the most underrated frontiersman of his time. With a list of accomplishments that rival his more famous contemporaries. James Kleiman was a first-hand witness to some of the seminal events in the history of the American frontier. He was not a hellraiser or a wild fellow like some of his compatriots were. It just seems that he survived on pure will and pure grit. Climate has been around the block, and if you don't know his story, you don't know what you're missing. Climate was born in 1792 on the farm that his father leased from none other than George Washington. As a boy, he learned to hunt and trap. He learned the frontier way. He learned how to do farming. He learned all the basics that you need to be a mountain man. And like so many young men of his time, as soon as he was old enough, he headed west to find his fortune. Well, the fur trade has really taken off, and if you needed a job, you could go to St. Louis, and there are companies hiring guys right and left. Kleiman arrives in St. Louis just in time to join one of the most remarkable expeditions of the frontier era. William Ashley was a successful Missouri businessman and politician who sought to reignite the American fur trade by enlisting 100 enterprising men to ascend the River Missouri to its source. Ashley almost immediately recognizes that Kleiman is a man of intelligence and great ability. And so he enlists Kleiman to help recruit that group of 100 men. Glad to have you, Aubrey. I'll see you at the landing where you receive your help. Kleiman turns out to be a skilled recruiter, quickly helping enlist the men who become known as Ashley's 100. I think they were desperate to get just about any man that they could get. Couldn't be too old, they couldn't be too young, they couldn't be sick. But I think beyond that, they would sign you up. We need men of good character, resilient, hardy. We'll be 100 men strong. Ashley is leading us to territory that's never been trapped. So many beaver, they're practically jumping into your boat. Right, and when our furs start flowing down to Missouri, every man still cool in his heels here in St. Louis will regret they stayed behind. 
You mark my words. I'll need to see your terms. Of course. Right this way, Mr. Reed Gibbs. Uh, folks call me here. Then let's step on in, Gibb, and have some coffee while I look over the terms. And though he doesn't know it yet, these men will play pivotal roles in the greatest adventure of Clyman's life. Traveling by keelboat hundreds of miles up the Missouri River with Ashley's expedition, Clyman reaches an important waypoint, the villages of the Arikara tribe. By the time they arrived in 1823, there had recently been some bad blood between the Arikaras and the Sioux and some other tribes along the Missouri. Ashley's company aren't quite sure what to expect, but they have no choice. They need horses. Horses are a key component of Ashley's venture that will enable him to send trapping parties overland. But the Arikara had something of a checkered history with members of white civilization. Musket ball, powder, no gun. After several days of trading, James Kleiman and his friend Reed Gibson are getting uneasy about their Arikara hosts. We've been back and forth for days. I don't like it. Easy, Gibson. Don't get jumpy. Right, we ain't going anywhere until the general secures some horses. Yeah. Three. Me. I take the river over some pesky nag every time. I'd wager the ponies would prefer that too. Mr. Kleiman, making on the ledger, we have to trade horses for a case of musket balls and a pound of powder per horse. Mr. Smith will make the selections. Hi, sir. After three days of trading, the Ashley Company has acquired 20 horses at the cost, as Kleiman notes, of significant quantities of ammunition. Some of the men thought that he was just arming the enemy and giving them a chance to attack. That's quite a bit of ammunition we're handing over. How many guns do you think they got up there? I don't like this place one bit, Jim. Yeah, I can feel it in my gut. We gotta get out of the river. Let's go and load the crates. But they don't plan to leave till the next day. So everybody's down on the river below these two Arikara villages. The man Ashley leaves in charge on the beach is Jedediah Smith, who will soon become a frontier legend himself. Get comfortable, men. General Ashley wants us to stay on the beach for the night. Wait, we're not going back to the boats. He's worried our yonder friends might try and take back a horse or two. Keep a sharp lookout. Why are we still here? Well, from Ashley's perspective, uh, maybe it's to show good faith. It smells like trouble, Kleiman. Yet neither Kleiman nor any man of Ashley's hundred have any idea just how bad that trouble will be. In the night, several of the rougher men in the group went looking for women in the village. And one of the men was shot in this process, sneaking around in the dark. Enraged by the provocative actions of the trappers, Arikara warriors cross the river during the night and launch a furious attack the next morning. Although taken by surprise, the trappers managed to hold their ground, at least at first. Everything started to go sideways. The men started scrambling. The horses were dropping. These are brave men. These are bold men, but they've never seen anything like this. They were totally fish in a barrel, sitting ducks, whatever you want to say.
think about the breadth, that line of fire on one spot on that beach. And that is just horrific. He elects to swim for it. Shoot me up! Clyman has barely escaped the massacre of his friends on the beach. But he's now just moments away from drowning as the battle rages around him. After escaping a chaotic battle, frontiersman James Clyman is moments away from drowning in the Missouri River. Shoot me up! Sorry, we gotta take care. Even worse, his panicked fellow trappers refuse to let Clyman into their overloaded canoe. So he tucks his gun down his pant leg, and the lock gets tangled up in his belt. Now he can't get the gun out, and, and he's starting to get worn out and, and you know, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it. But as Clyman is about to draw his very last breath, he's plucked from the swirling waters of the river. Reed Gibson was on one of these boats and helped Clyman get onto the skiff. Gibson, we gotta move! But Clyman's ordeal isn't over. In fact, it's just beginning. Jim, I think I've been shot. Now completely exposed on the river, Clyman has only one choice. Row as hard as he can for the opposite bank. Come on, we're getting out of here. We gotta paddle. All right, come on. Not one, but three Aripua warriors have followed him. And he's, of course, dropped his gun and his knife in the course of crossing the river. Cut off from help and completely unarmed, Clyman has no way to defend himself or his friend, Reed Gibson, who urges Clyman to save himself. Leave me. All they'll get is my scalp. I'll stay low. I'll come back if I can make it. Trying to lure the Arikaras away from his injured friend, Clyman begins a deadly game of cat and mouse. Clyman could do is pray the Arikaras don't spot him. To ensure the Arikaras don't circle back for Gibson, Clyman risks a cheeky show of defiance to lead them back into the woods. As legend has it, Clyman spies his Arikara pursuers and gives them a bow. After escaping the Arikaras, Clyman skirts the riverbank, and by sheer chance, he finds Jed Smith and a few other survivors. Jed, it's me! Clyman? Clyman! Clyman. Oh, Clyman. Sight for sore eyes. We thought you drowned. 
and while retreating downstream in canoes, Smith found Gibson as well. But when Kleiman arrives, his friend is fading fast. He's in a bad way. Gibson! Save my life. Gibson dies right there uh, in Kleiman's arms. And Kleiman is thinking, man, this guy saved my life. And now he's dead. <laughs> Although many of their dead were left behind on the beach, the trappers hold a hasty funeral. And as did your son, Jesus Christ, O Lord, these men have died so that we may live. We commit their spirits into thy holy care. And now, James Kleiman faces the hardest decision of his life. Mr. Kleiman, you may have heard the general intends to push on. We will fight him again if we have to. But the general needs to know who will stay the course and who will take the boat back downriver. Back to St. Louis? Doesn't that make them deserters? There's no shame in departing. We didn't sign up for war. For this journey, Fewer men had stronger ideas of their bravery than I. But what happened on that river may have cooled my courage some. They push off within the hour. You can oblige me by tending to the wounded. You misunderstand me, Jed. I'll never desert you, nor the others. Or will I ever? I knew you to be a man of great spirit. Oh, come on, General will be glad to hear it. But after burying their dead comrades, the men of Ashley's expedition turned their thoughts from sorrow to revenge. the massacre rapidly spreads across the frontier, spurring the U.S. Army into action against the Aripuras. And as troops under Colonel Henry Leavenworth march up the Missouri, trappers led by Jed Smith converge as well. On August 2nd, 1823, what becomes known as the Missouri Legion arrives, along with a contingent of native allies. About 750 Sioux arrived to go along with Leavenworth's men to attack the Arikara villages. They were mortal enemies with the Arikaras for a very long time. But Colonel Leavenworth doesn't seem inclined to launch a headlong assault. Gentlemen, as you know, our objective is to secure and make good this great river road. And mark my words, we will humble the Arikara. And we will make them pay for the blood that they have spilt here. General Ashley, your men show remarkable bravery in returning to this place of outrage. Stand ready, men. You will be called upon soon. Soon. Say what you will about this Leavenworth fellow, but the man is deliberate. Yeah, and if I know the Colonel, his main concern with this assault is political. I'll wager we'll be here for a while. But the fragile truce between the Arikaras and the Americans is broken by a glory-seeking Sioux warrior. 
the warriors who are standing by waiting to attack. They want to stay out of rifle range when possible during the siege. So one of the warriors rides his horse right to the front of the village, and over 50 rifles shoot at this one man on his horse. Or well, maybe not. On your toes, men! Make ready your primer! As Clyman and the trappers cheer him on, the warrior taunts the Auricolas from just outside the range of their rifles. Then this warrior comes out whooping and just completely energized and unhurt. The warrior's bravery triggers an instant fusillade of long-range gunfire from both sides. <laughs> it's always louder than you expect, isn't it? Let them have it, boys! As the battle opens up, Leavenworth's forces unleash a pretty devastating fire from those cannon against the village. Yet to the intense disappointment of the vengeful trappers, the battle quickly peters out into a parlay. The Rickeries begged for peace, almost before the first shot is even fired. Leavenworth's Sioux allies soon inform him that the Arikaras are prepared to surrender and even abandon their village. It appears a negotiation is in the works. Is that it? Will Leavenworth not fight? Sir, respectfully, we spent the last 10 years at Council Bluffs eating nothing but pumpkins. And now, at long last, a small opportunity for a promotion manifests. I insist we be allowed to attack the village. Raising their village to the ground is not one of our objectives, Captain. Then allow me to lead an assault, sir. I can overwhelm them with one bold charge. No, Captain. They have offered a surrender. We will accept it. Sir. Captain. You have your orders. That is all. I'm sure the mood for many of the men was one of defeat. They had suffered pretty heavy blow and losses in the first part of the battle. And then at the end of it, they were in a no really different position than they were when they started. The end of the Arikara War is a disappointment to almost everyone involved. But its consequences are even worse. Mr. Ashley, Colonel Leavenworth gives his regards. He is already on the keel boats headed back. So you and your men are on your own at this time. Following the destruction of their village, the furious Arikaras scatter up and down the Missouri River. The Missouri River was shut down as a thoroughfare. So everything has to change. Well, General, now what? Well. Thanks to the benevolence of the U.S. Army, the Arikara are scattered all up and down the upper Missouri. Their hearts are full of anger, and we can no longer reach the Yellowstone by boat. But we don't have any horses either, General. No. No, indeed. Mr. Smith, how fair is the rest of the brigade? They're breaking camp upriver. A full fight. With the river closed to him, Ashley must ask Clyman and his other men to undertake a risky new venture. Well, I propose we march to meet the crow on the Yellowstone, winter there, and then trap all of next season. Y'all ready to get back to work, lads? I am, General. As am I. Good to hear. Bravo to you, lads, and everybody is full of heart and bravery. Mr. Smith, walk with me. Let's discuss routes. Yet as Clyman prepares to finally leave the place where he fought for his life and lost close friends in battle, he has no way of knowing that the hardest part of his journey still lies ahead. Fighting in the brief Arikara War of 1823, frontiersman James Kleiman is finally setting out to trap for beaver. All right, men, let's get ready to break camp. Keep your eyes peeled. How many of us are left yet? Number 10 now that the wounded are on the river. I'm afraid it's too late to join them. No. No, it's. It's just that when we started, there were over 60 of us. Now so few of us are left. 
<laughs> Fear not, my friend. It's for the best. Now that the pork eaters and layabouts are downriver. Now that the easy part's over. Hey, well, hold up, Jed. That was the easy part? Climbing sets off into the wilderness on a history-making journey with no idea of the dangers that lie in wait. Throughout the fall of 1823, the brigade led by Smith and Kleiman traps and explores across present-day South Dakota. But before long, they encounter another of the frontier's deadliest predators. Jed, bear. Stay back. I'll distract him. Every time someone tangled with a grizzly bear, it usually was the bear coming out number one. And certainly that was the case with Jed Smith. The grizzly at one point has Jed's entire head in his mouth, and he virtually rips his scalp off. But in what becomes one of the most celebrated stories of the entire frontier era, Smith's amazing courage and Kleiman's steady calm prevent the attack from turning fatal. Does anyone have a needle and thread at all? He tells Kleiman, get a needle and thread and sew on everything you can on my head. I hate the prettiest thing you ever seen. Did the nicest job I could, sir. I'm sure you have, Mr. Kleiman. And I thank you for it. These are the type of things that helps you build a lasting friendship with the person that you experienced it with. So a totally unique and unbreakable bond is formed between these men. Kleiman and Smith continue west across the southern part of the Black Hills and entered what is today Wyoming and followed the Sweetwater River. Now hundreds of miles from any settlement, Smith and Kleiman face a new peril they can't handle alone. Winter is coming, and they really need to settle in somewhere. And they're headed toward the Crow Indian land to hopefully try to negotiate with the Crow. Far from any source of supplies, Kleiman's brigade won't survive winter without help from the Crow tribe. Jed Smith and his group have a man who negotiates things between Smith's party and the Crow. Yeah, we should have no need for that, Mr. Kleiman. And for Kleiman, memories of his deadly encounter with the Arigaras are all too fresh. But for better or worse, Kleiman must now place himself at the mercy of a native tribe Let's go, man. for a second time. With winter approaching in the wilderness, frontiersman James Kleiman must turn to the Crow tribe for food and shelter, despite nearly dying at the hands of another native tribe just a few months before. I'm sure you recall the last time we tried trading with Indians. Well, we should have no problem here. The Crow are friends. We thought the Arikara were too. Well, every tribe has their own way, Mr. Kleiman. How they regard our presence here varies from welcome to hatred to every shade of feeling in between. Now, the Crow have no ingrained ill will for us, but if we or some other brigade wronged them, that could change. And we should hope it doesn't. The Crow are a strong and proud people. Fortunately for Kleiman and his brigade, the Crow decide to let them spend the winter at their camp. Let's get acquainted. I'm keen to learn what they know about crossing the Rockies. And if they got a good enough supper, I'm equally as keen. <laughs> Let's go, man. As winter turns to spring, the brigade led by Smith and Plyman resumes trapping, taking a rich haul of pelts at last. 
but finally ready to return to the settlements with their valuable catch, they face a new problem. Without horses to haul their sizable cash to the Missouri River, the trappers must improvise a new way to move them. I think we can make bull boats, float the beaver packs down uh, to an outpost on the Missouri. They realize that this sweet water goes east and that might get them to uh, a place where they can get down to St. Louis. Well, you could load the pelts on the bull boats here on the sweet water, and I suppose that would flow through the North Platte under the Missouri. But we haven't traced that far, so we can't be sure. As usual, Mr. Clyman, you provided a solution. You'll oblige us by scouting ahead with me to see which river the Sweetwater joins. Oh, with all due respect, Captain, I was not proposing Well, to... weren't you once a surveyor? I was back in Illinois, well, but... north and south in Illinois is north and south here. Pack your powder. Make it quick. After scouting the Sweetwater River, Clyman believes they can build improvised boats and float their catch down tributaries of the Missouri back to the settlements. Yeah, if I had to guess, I'd say this joins the Platte of Day Choose March further down. Yeah, but that's just a guess, Jed. Well, I'll take your guess over mine. Why don't you head down river another day? Find us a camp. I'll bring up the brigade. We'll load what we can and cache the rest. Very well. I'll be waiting. At this point, Kleiman went ahead of the group and arrived at the confluence of the Sweetwater and Platte Rivers. There, Kleiman makes camp and settles in to wait for the brigade. But quickly discovers he's not alone. He realizes that there's a war party of Blackfoot right across the river from him encounters between American trappers and Blackfeet almost always ended in a fight. So Kleiman couldn't risk discovery. Smith arrives at the appointed meeting spot the next day, he's confronted with a terrible dilemma. Six. I count 10 warrior tracks. No idea where climbing might be. Men, I can only conclude that climbing is beyond our help. We must look to the safety of the brigade. Step out, we'll march till nightfall. Smith makes the difficult decision not to search for climbing, unaware that his friend is actually very much alive. After waiting for several days with no sign of his friend Smith, Kleiman realizes he's now entirely on his own. He had to make a choice about whether to go in search of them and risk getting killed by the Blackfeet, or simply head east and try and reach Fort Atkinson, which was many, many, many miles away. Oh, musket balls. Fort Atkinson's somewhere in that direction. Kleiman has only a vague idea of his location, but he hopes the river he's following will take him to Fort Atkinson. The prospect of that must have been incredibly daunting, but he really didn't have a choice. And so he just put one foot in front of the other and started marching to the east, downriver. James Kleiman knows he faces a trek over hundreds of miles of hostile wilderness but he has little idea that the journey will become an epic saga of the frontier era. After escaping a prowling war party of Blackfeet, 
Frontiersman James Kleiman now faces a harrowing ordeal. To reach the safety of a fort on the Missouri River, he must make a 600-mile wilderness trek and do it utterly alone. Kleiman's arduous journey stretches over days and then weeks as he becomes weaker both physically and mentally. So this trip was physically exhausting. He didn't have very much to eat. The human body can famously go only days without water, but weeks without food. But very quickly, your judgment is affected, your sense of direction, the body begins eating itself. It was extremely grueling on him psychologically, and he started to pine for human contact of any kind, even if it might prove fatal. Hundreds of miles into his ordeal, Kleiman has reached the end of his endurance. And he's prepared to take any risk to survive. When he encounters a Pawnee village, his reaction isn't concern or hesitation, but hope. Kleiman has experienced both brutal violence and friendly hospitality from native tribes. And he can only hope that this one will have mercy on his extreme distress. So he actually ends up walking right into the village, not knowing what kind of welcome awaits him. But within moments, Kleiman discovers he may have made a terrible mistake. All the trappers knew that when you were in a serious situation with a Native American tribe, you didn't want to show fear. If you showed any kind of fright, you were done. Kleiman knows that if he resists, the warriors will kill him. But if he shows fear, they may kill him anyway. They do it! I'm ready for death! But if you showed bravery, they appreciated that. Against all the odds, Kleiman's incredible display of courage impresses the chief of the Pawnee village. his first real food in weeks, Kleiman takes stock of his new situation. But the Pawnee chief's mercy may be too good to be true. And suddenly, James Kleiman faces death yet again, this time with no hope of rescue or escape. After nearly dying at the hands of fearsome Pawnee warriors, frontiersman James Kleiman is now entirely at the mercy of the village chief. But having impressed the Pawnees with his bravery, the chief only wants a lock of Kleiman's hair as a trophy. Kleiman rather wryly in his memoirs said that uh, he kept his scalp, but he lost his hair. Kleiman would never know the name of the chief who saved his life or why he did so. 
if he hadn't come upon a party of Pawnees, he probably wouldn't have made it. It was the help of Native peoples that saved his life. But Kleiman would never forget that in his darkest hour, he found salvation from a Native American tribe. Kleiman's weary journey continues. And after nearly three months, he surpassed the limits of human endurance. You know, the story of the mountain men is uh, replete with these tales of solo adventures. And certainly, Kleiman's tale is as strong as uh, any of them. Kleiman's ironclad determination to survive keeps him moving, mile after grueling mile. After weeks of trudging eastward, Kleiman has all but given up hope when, miraculously, he sees something in the distance. And as he approaches, it becomes clear that that thing is, in fact, the American flag flying above a fort. He sees old glory flying over the fort, and he realizes he's made it. You know, it's like, that's our flag. And after harrowing adventures and peril that could have killed him at any turn, James Kleiman has lived to tell his tale. Reflecting on the life of James Kleiman, we come away with a confirmed sense that this was an important man. Really had a great life in both his narratives in his later years. So, without Kleiman, we wouldn't know hardly anything about some of these events that happened. The adventures that he recounts are priceless. They're accurate depictions of those adventures and not just tall tales. Let's do it! I'm ready for death! He wasn't simply an observer of these great moments in American history. He was a participant. Come on, we're getting out of here! 